Hi guys, so today we're going to be talking about centripetal force. This is the net force that causes centripetal acceleration. It's represented by F subscript C, and the direction is always towards the center of the circle. The centripetal force is also known as the center-seeking force. This is not a new type of force. It must be supplied by one of the forces we already know. It can be provided by one or multiple forces. Vertical circles are a section of this unit that many students find tricky, so here are some tips on how to approach those word problems. So in a vertical circle, centripetal acceleration is provided by tension and sometimes gravity, depending on where the object is in the loop. You always must draw out the free body diagram to help understand whether gravity is adding or subtracting from the centripetal force. Anytime you're solving for a minimum, whether that's minimum tension, minimum speed, or any other minimum, then we know that the free body diagram would be the object at the top of the circle. On the other hand, when the question is asking for a maximum, whether that's maximum tension, speed, or another maximum, that's the object at the bottom of the circle. Here are some examples of free body diagrams, the first one being when the child swings friend around in a circle on the ice. Assuming ice is frictionless, so the normal force is in the upwards direction and gravitational is in the downwards direction, whereas the tension is the horizontal force, which provides the centripetal force. A second scenario is a child swinging a yo-yo in a horizontal circle. We always have gravity acting in the downwards direction. In this case, tension is upwards at a diagonal. The reason for this is because if tension was at a horizontal, there'd be no y component to counteract the gravity force, and thus it would no longer be a horizontal circle, rather it'd be at an angle downwards. Therefore, the tension must be at an upwards diagonal force in order to have that y component counteract gravity, and then that horizontal force is the x component of the tension, which provides the centripetal force. The third scenario, so the child swings a bucket full of water in a vertical circle. So as mentioned, at the top of the circle, this would be any minimum, so minimum tension or speed. In this case, tension and gravity would be acting downwards. On the other hand, at the bottom of the circle, gravity is still acting downwards, however tension is acting upwards. The fourth scenario is a car rounding a corner on a level road. So in this case, normal force is acting upwards, gravitation is acting downwards. The force that provides the centripetal force is friction. Last but not least, a car rounding a banked curve. So in this case, I've drawn on the right the scenario that the free body diagram represents. In this case, the gravitational force is acting downwards as always. The normal force is acting diagonally upwards, pointing inwards to the curve. The frictional force is also pointing inwards and diagonally downwards due to the banked curve. Now, banked curves are special cases in where there's actually no rotation of the frame of reference, so the free body diagram must be kept in this manner. You can't simplify these type of problems using that problem-solving tip introduced in an earlier video. Recall that F is equal to ma through Newton's second law, and we went through three different formula variations of centripetal acceleration. Now applying that to centripetal force using Newton's second law, you just add an m to each of those formulas to get your three formula variations. The first one being that the magnitude of centripetal force is equal to mv squared over r. The second one being 4 pi squared mr over t squared, again t being period. The third one being 4 pi squared mr f squared, again f being frequency. The direction of the centripetal force is always towards the center of the circle, which is the same as centripetal acceleration. Now moving on to some examples. So number one, a car of mass 1.1 times 10 to the 3 kilograms negotiates a level curve at a constant speed of 22 meter per second. The curve has a radius of 85 meters. Part A asks, what is the magnitude of the force required to keep the car from skidding sideways? What provides this force? So we know the mass, speed, and radius, and we're solving for centripetal force. So what provides the centripetal force in this case? Since it's a level curve, we know that the normal force doesn't contribute. Therefore, the only force providing this centripetal force is the friction. When you draw the free body diagram, the normal force is upwards, gravitational is downwards, and friction is the only force in the horizontal component. Letting upwards and the horizontal component that friction acts in be positive, since we're working with the horizontal component, you would have to solve for net force in the x component, which is just equal to the frictional force. So Fc is equal to Ff. 
We know that centripetal force, one of the formula variations, is mv squared over r, which are all the variables that were given to us. And then just plugging those numbers in, we get that the frictional force is 6.3 times 10 to the 3 newtons. If the question were to ask for the coefficient of friction, in that case, remembering that friction is the coefficient times the normal force, solving the net force in the y component, we know there's no acceleration in the y component. Normal force is just equal to mg, plugging that in. mv squared over r is just equal to the coefficient times mg. Mass cancels since it's present on both sides. And then isolating for the coefficient, you get 0.58. For part B, the same car negotiates the curve, except this time the curve is banked at an angle of 19 degrees to the horizontal. Assume no friction. At what speed can the car travel around the curve without sliding off? So we know mass and radius from the initial givens. We know now that theta is equal to 19 degrees, and we're solving for a speed. Drawing the free body diagram, we know there's no friction force, so the only forces acting are normal force and gravitational force. Gravitational force is always acting in the downwards direction. As for the normal force, since this is a banked curve this time, the normal force is pointing upwards and diagonally inwards at an angle of theta. In this case, the centripetal force is actually the x component of the normal force. Letting upwards and inwards be positive, First, solving for the net force in the y component, we know there's no acceleration in the y component, hence it's equal to zero, which is equal to the y component of the normal force, which is related through cos theta, since that's the adjacent side relative to theta, minus mg, which is the gravitational force. Isolating for the normal force, fn is equal to mg over cos theta. Solving for the net force in the x component is just equal to the x component of the normal force. This is related through sine theta, since that's the opposite side relative to theta. We know that in the x component, it's equal to centripetal force. So centripetal force is equal to fn sine theta. mv squared over r, which is centripetal force, is equal to mg sine theta over cos theta, since we're plugging that normal force that we solved for in the y component into here. Since mass is present on both sides, that variable cancels. Isolating for speed, we get that the speed is equal to 16.94 meter per second, which rounds to 17 meters per second. This is the speed the car can travel around the curve without sliding off. Here's a second example. So a pilot can experience about 4G safely. How fast can the pilot make a vertical loop with a radius of 120 meters? So we know radius. We know the normal force is equal to 4 times the gravitational force since the pilot can experience 4G safely, and we're solving for max speed. As mentioned previously in the vertical circles slide, anytime we're solving for a maximum, that's always when the object is at the bottom of the vertical circle. Drawing the free body diagram at the bottom, we know that normal force is acting upwards and gravitational force is acting downwards. Letting upwards be positive, the net force in the y component is equal to the normal force minus the gravitational force. The centripetal force in this case is towards the center of the circle, so that's in the upwards direction. Fc is equal to Fn minus Fg. Plugging in the formulas, mv squared over r is equal to 4mg, which was given to us, minus mg. Isolating for speed, the maximum speed the pilot can have is 59 meter per second. Now here's the last example before moving on to the Nelson textbook problems. So number three says, what is the minimum frequency with which you can swing a bucket of water over your head if your arm is 1.2 meters long? So we know radius, and we're solving for minimum frequency. As mentioned previously, anytime we're solving for any type of minimum, that will be at the top of the vertical circle. So drawing the free body diagram at the top, gravitational force is the only force acting in the downwards direction. For the slowest speed, there will always be zero tension. This is why there's no tension in this free body diagram. Letting downwards be positive, the net force in the y component is equal to the centripetal force since that's towards the center of the circle. Centripetal force is equal to gravitational force, which is equal to mg. Using the formula variation that has frequency in it, 4 pi squared r mf squared is equal to mg, and canceling the masses on both sides, icing for frequency. The minimum frequency which you can swing the bucket is 0.46 hertz. Now moving on to the Nelson textbook problems, starting off with question number 1 on page 124. The track near the top of a roller coaster has a circular shape with a diameter of 24 meters forming a hill. When you're at the top, you feel as if your weight is only one-third of your true weight. 
Calculate the speed of the roller coaster as it rolls over the top of the hill. Since we're given diameter and we know that radius is half of the diameter, we know that the radius is 12 meters. We know that the normal force is equal to one third of the gravitational force since it said in the question that you feel as if your weight is only one third of your true weight. And we know that apparent weight is equal to normal force. Here we're calculating for speed. Drawing the free body diagram, the normal force acts in the upwards direction and gravitational in the downwards direction. Letting downwards be positive, the net force in the y component is equal to the gravitational force minus the normal force. Centripetal force is in the downwards direction since that's towards the center of the circle, which is equal to Fg minus one third Fg. Again, canceling mass since that's present on both sides, you can isolate for V. Solving that, you get that the speed of the roller coaster as it rolls over the top of the hill is 8.9 meter per second. Moving on to question number two, a car with a mass of 1,000 kilograms is traveling over the top of a hill as shown. The hill's curvature has a radius of 40 meters and the car is traveling at 15 meter per second. Part A just tells us to draw a free body diagram. In this case, we know that the only forces acting are normal force and gravitational force. Normal is acting in the upwards direction and gravitational in the downwards direction. And I'm going to let downwards be positive once again since this is the direction of the centripetal force since that's towards the center of the circle. Part B says determine the magnitude of the normal force between the hill and the car at the top of the hill. So we know mass and radius and speed, and here we're solving for normal force. Solving for net force in the y component, we know that's equal to Fg minus Fn. We know that the net force in the y component is also equal to the centripetal force, which is why I brought over the centripetal force onto the other side. So zero is equal to Fg minus Fc minus Fn. Note that because the centripetal force is in the downwards direction, it was positive, but when you bring it to the other side, it becomes negative. Isolating for the normal force, it's equal to Fg minus centripetal force. You solve and you get that the normal force is equal to 4.2 times 10 to the 3 newtons. The textbook made an error in the solution, so just keep an eye out for that. For part C, it says determine the speed required to make the driver feel weightless at the top of the hill. Again, we know apparent weight is equal to normal force. In order for the driver to feel weightless, the normal force must be equal to zero. Using that equation that we solved for in the previous part of the question, setting normal force equal to zero, we can isolate for speed. When we do that, we get that the speed required is 19.8 meter per second, which is 2.0 times 10 meter per second, using two sig figs. For question number three, a civil engineer is designing a banked curve on a highway. The banked curve is designed to allow the cars to move safely in a horizontal circle. What will happen to the maximum speed of a car on the curve when the following changes are made? Explain your reasoning, considering each change separately. In order to solve each of these scenario questions, the first thing I would suggest is to draw a free body diagram. So for a banked curve, we know that the normal force would be acting inwards to the curve at a diagonal upwards. And we know the friction force would be pointing inwards at a diagonal downwards, with theta being the banked angle of the curve. So in scenario one, if you were to increase theta, you'd actually increase the maximum speed the car can move safely at because by increasing theta, you're increasing the x component of the normal force. In part b, the scenario is that the coefficient of friction between the tires and the road is larger. If you increase the coefficient of friction, you're increasing the frictional force. Thus, by increasing the coefficient of friction, you'll increase the Vmax because friction force is increasing and friction force points into the turn. Note that in this case, normal force and frictional force, both their x components, are contributing to the centripetal force, and we know that centripetal force is equal to mv squared over r. In part c, it asks what would happen when a heavier car is used. You note that every question we've solved so far, the masses always cancel because the variable is present on both sides, and thus, if there was a heavier car, there'd be no changes since the mass cancels anyways. For question number four, a car moves in a horizontal circle on a test track with a radius of 1.2 times 10 to the 2 meters. The coefficient of static friction between the tires and the road is 0.72. Draw a free body diagram and then calculate the maximum speed of the car. So we know radius and we know the coefficient of static friction. First of all, starting with that free body diagram, we know that normal force is acting upwards, gravitation is acting downwards, the static friction is the only horizontal force acting on the free body diagram. So letting upwards in the horizontal that static friction acts in be positive. 
First, solving for the y component of net force, since we need to know what normal force is equal to. In this case, we know that acceleration is equal to zero in the y component. Since it's a horizontal circle, we know that normal force is just equal to gravitational force, which is just mg. Solving for x component of net force, we know there's only one horizontal force, which is static friction. Since centripetal force is always towards the center of the circle, we know the net force in the x component is equal to centripetal force, which is equal to the static friction once again. So mv squared over r, which is centripetal force, is equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal force, which is mg. Again, masses cancel since the term is present on both sides of the equation. Isolating for v max, the max speed that can be attained by the car is 29 meter per second. Lastly, for question number 6, an air pack with a mass of 0.26 kilograms is tied to a string and moves at a constant speed in a circle of radius 1.2 meters. The other end of the string goes through a hole in the air table and straight down to a suspended mass of 0.68 kilograms, which hangs at rest. Calculate the speed of the air pack. So we know m1, which is the air pack, we know radius of the circle, and we're solving for speed of the air pack. We also know the mass of the suspended mass, and we know that net force of the suspended mass must be zero, since it says that it's hanging at rest. First of all, we'll be dealing with the free body diagram of the suspended mass, which is m2. There's only two forces acting, both of which are in the y component. So tension is acting in the upwards direction, and gravitation is acting in the downwards direction. Letting upwards be positive, we're solving for net force in the y component. We know that net force in the y component is equal to zero since it's at rest. So the tension force minus the gravitational force is equal to zero. Isolating for tension force, we know that the tension force is equal to m2 times gravity. Now that we know this piece of information, we can actually work with the free body diagram of the air puck. So the air puck's free body diagram has three forces acting, which are the normal force, the gravitational force, and the tension force. Letting upwards in the horizontal force which points towards the center of the circle be positive. The net force in the x component is just equal to the tension force. We know that the net force in the x component is equal to centripetal force since that's towards the center of the circle. So Fc is equal to Ft. Plugging those formulas in, since this pertains to mass 1, we know that m1 times v squared over r is the centripetal force. And we solve for tension force using m2, so that's equal to m2g. Isolating for speed, you get that the speed of the air puck is 5.546 meter per second. Rounding to two sig figs, that's 5.5 meters per second. So that wraps it up for this video. Stay tuned for next time, which is actually the last video in this unit, to talk about rotating frames of reference.